Hi, everyone who's watching either on YouTube or live. This is our first session for 2023. As you may know, we did the Con OS debate in November and then we had a break in December. And so I, for one, have missed our um, sessions and our team, which is, of course, led by Dr. Galandiak. Um, I think today, particularly, we're very fortunate to have an opportunity to speak with some incredible con clinicians from the team from NYU. And having an opportunity to get Dr. Ramsey to expand on his knowledge about pouches is quite unique. And so for, particularly for the special guest, Dr. Ramsey is going to share with us some of his slides. And that will be uh, most likely, depending on the time, will be recorded as a separate thing which uh, people can access through the DCR YouTube channel. And uh, it's one of those things which is incredibly difficult to cut off because the the, the education is invaluable. So if we go over, I think it's it would be very useful for people. All right. On this uh, note, can we please get the slides up? Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, this is our team. I uh, hope everyone had a good Christmas and New Year break. Um, next slide, please. Please find our disclaimers. Um, next slide. So today, of course, we are in New York City. And as I've sort of tried to have a custom of introducing a random fact about um, the host uh, city, I found that Manhattan not only has a Fifth Avenue and a Sixth Avenue, but there is a Six and a Half Avenue, uh, which is an interesting street between 51st and 57th Street. So that that's, um, I don't think any other city has a half street. On that note, I'd like to formally um, introduce Dr. Ramsey. He's the um, director of the IBD Institute and in NYU. We're going to have a blurb about, uh, a, a very limited blurb about uh, his accomplishments of which there are, uh, there is enormous amount, but I'd be grateful if he talks about his institution, and also his team. Thank him for uh, supporting us and hosting this session. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Vlad. Thanks so much for having us. And, uh, uh, it's a great privilege having Dr. Glendiak and us all uh, included here. And, uh, you know, in our, uh, uh, we actually have two divisions. Uh, recently, we had the privilege of recruiting Dr. Bashar Safar and uh, uh, Chadi Atala. Uh, and we thank the Mitch Bernstein's many years of service to our institution. And uh, we work well as a, a, a group and uh, specifically, uh, we have a center that we sit together side by side with our gastroenterology colleagues. We had the privilege of serving many patients, not only the tri-state area, but all around the country. And, and I hope the audience will find uh, helpful uh, to be able to share some of the experiences uh, that we had throughout the years. Again, thank you so much for having us. Now, we have an incredible group here. This is our IBD uh, division. Dr. Dan Wong, uh, to start with, is our uh, stellar fellow, followed by our years of postdoc research, Dr. Aaron Essen. And uh, we had the privilege of recruiting uh, several of our alumni uh, from the Cleveland Clinic, including Dr. Kurat, Dr. Luis Moreira, and Dr. Arkan, in one way, that who spent some time as a medical student here. And actually, they have this picture at the beach in Lake Erie together with Dr. Kurat and Dr. Arkan to be used in the future in future presentations. Uh, recently, we had the privilege of having Dr. Jessica Simon joining us, that uh, she was in Louisiana. We got the best part of the Long Island, uh, Suffolk County, uh, joining us to our group, incredibly skilled, talented surgeon that whom we have the privilege of joining us. So we're growing. And here is the, uh, my dear colleague that who we are so privileged to have, Dr. Bashar Safar. And again, many years of dedication of Dr. Bernstein's, we uh, uh, thank for his service, Dr. Greco, who runs our program director and also the, uh, you know, the head of the Bellevue uh, structure, and Dr. Raul Narang, that, uh, you know, another uh, Cleveland Clinic Florida alumni, just like Dr. Safar. And we got, uh, uh, you know, the incredible talent with pelvic floor uh, person, Dr. Isabella Lianek. And also Dr. Bashar brought one of his uh, colleagues, friend, uh, 
incredible skills from Hopkins, Dr. Chad Atala. We have our research associate, Dr. Akos, who's working very hard, and Dr. Gilmas, who's our brand new uh, research, uh, you know, the postdoc that visiting us, actually working with us from overseas Turkey. Again, thank you so much for having us as a group. And actually, we tried to do it as a conference room, but all of us are here, and they're just, all of them are saying hello to all of you. Again, thank you so much for having us and allowing us to be part of tonight's event. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so next slide, we have a poll. Um, so today's poll is um, the question about what is the role of a three-stage formation of the pelvic pouch, um, I guess, compared to a modified two-stage, one-stage. Uh, we all know there's a number of different combinations. So um, if everyone can uh, click what they think the answer is, and then we'll present the poll in the end. And whilst we're doing this, can we move to the next slide and um, start with the first paper? So the first paper is titled Perianal Fistula after Ilioanal Pouch in Patients with Ulcerative Colitis, a review of 475 patients operated in a major IBD center. This paper comes from Mount Sinai not far from NYU um, in New York, uh, with Dr. Heyman being the first author. The paper will be presented by Dr. Wong, and then Dr. Luz Moreira will kindly give us some expert commentary. So thank you, Dr. Wong. Please start when you're ready. Hey, good evening, everybody. Again, my name is Dan Wong. I'm the colorectal fellow here at NYU. Uh, as you're all aware, the development of perianal fistula following pouch surgery is both a frustrating and difficult to treat complication. The fistula may develop in the setting of an anatomic issue, a surgical complication, an inflammatory process, or some combination thereof. Uh, in this paper, Dr. Hyman describes the development of perianal fistula within a cohort of 475 consecutive patients who had a preoperative diagnosis of ulcerative colitis and subsequently underwent proctocolectomy and pouch surgery at Mount Sinai between 1983 and 2015. The primary outcome of the study was the incidence of perianal fistula. Fistula that developed within five years of the operation were defined as early onset. Those after five years were late onset. And a univariate analysis was done to examine factors associated with both the development of fistula as well as the timing thereof. Uh, here's figure one. This shows the cumulative incidence of perianal fistula within the cohort over time. Uh, in this figure, the cohort is divided into two groups. The red curve depicts patients with a consistent diagnosis of ulcerative colitis, and you can see a slowly growing um, uh, accumulation of perianal fistula right around 10% being the, uh, the top of that curve. And then the blue curve is patients who were subsequently diagnosed either with intermittent colitis or Crohn's disease. And you can see they have a quite high uh, prevalence of, of fistula in that group, close to 80%. Overall, for the whole cohort, uh, the, uh, the, the prevalence of perianal fistula was 9%. Uh, one quarter of these patients who developed a uh, fistula required a return to ileostomy as compared to seven, the 7% 7 in people who didn't develop fistula. And the majority of those patients who developed an, who required an ileostomy in the fistula ultimately required a pouch excision. A univariate analysis showed that younger age at surgery and anastomotic complications were associated with fistula development. And uh, notably, whether a mucosectomy was performed or the severity of rectal inflammation at the time of surgery was not associated with fistula development. Additionally, post-operative complications, uh, especially septic complications and leaks, were associated with early fistula development. In summary, uh, in this cohort, approximately one out of 10 patients ultimately developed perineal fistula, and uh, notably surgical or anatomic issues are associated with fistula development, especially early onset fistula and a higher rate of return to ileostomy. That's a very succinct summary. Um, if I can possibly get Dr. Luz Moreira to, to give us some of his expert comments on, on the study. Hello, everyone. Um, this paper um, shows basically the Sinai experience with fistulas, perianal fistulas in, in, in pouch patients. That's something we see here, especially we are uh, being a referral center for pouch complications. And I think one of the key points of this paper is timing timing of the fistula presentation. I think this is key in order to make the diagnosis of Crohn's or post-operative complications. And this is really important because we see a lot of patients that come to us um, labeled as Crohn's. And when you look at the uh, 
history and uh, especially the complications, the post-op complications of pouches, they actually, they're not curls, they're, they're surgical complications. And that changes uh, a lot of things, especially the indication for redo pouch um, and how you manage the fistulas. Um, the, the paper used five years as a cut-off. I don't know if that's the, you know, the ideal cut-off. I know it's a very arbitrary cut-off, but um, definitely the early fistulas are more related to post-operative complications. And, um, and some of these patients can be rescued with the radial pouches and these fistulas can be actually treated um, with a, a radial pouch procedure. So one, one thing is, I mean, I agree with Dr. Marara. I think the critical part of it is that uh, Caldwell Esselstyn at the Cleveland Clinic, who was uh, Barney Cryle's son-in-law, used to say to me when I was a resident, check your own footsteps. I think the critical message on this article is checking one's footsteps. Rather than labeling somebody as a Crohn's disease on someone who had actually a leak after a J-POP procedure, and then even the fact that these things can present years after, after which is a common thing, Crohn's and send it to the gastroenterologist and have them to pump with biologics with years of years of suffering is really futile. Uh, and I am not blaming the gastroenterologist on that. And I'm kind of uh, blaming us as surgeons taking the ownership of these complications and rethinking about it is uh, very, very critical. So the critical thing when I, when these patients come up and I ask them, forget about this uh, doctor said, this doctor said, what happened after the part index j pouch surgery? Did you have any CT guided drainage? Did you have any fever? Did you have abscess? Did they have to take you back? And when you hear about these things or the patient, did you feel right at all after they close your ileostomy? If they say no, tough to blame these patients, the fistula in six months or beyond as a Crohn's disease. And this is really where we stand on these things and we try to push limit. Coming back to Dr. Marrera's points about the Crohn's patients sent to us, we have done this study in Cleveland uh, that with Kelly Garrett, who is in Cornell right now, the numbers turned out to be the same. 70% of the patients who were sent to us at that time turned out to be not to have a Crohn's disease. We repeated the same article uh, here with Dr. Uh, Aaron Essen, and the numbers up to 77% on there. So. I think we need to stop labeling patients Crohn's disease liberally. We need to question the surgical complications as a cause of the fistulization, as his authors uh, showed it very uh, uh, clearly. I, I think that, that those are very useful points. Thank you both. Um, I sometimes tell my residents if I was a heavily religious man and I couldn't blame God, I would blame Crohn's for everything. Um, <laughs> but, but um, I, I want to focus a little bit more on the on the actual different uh, types of, of fistulas. So I gather there are um, there's pouchitis due to Crohn's disease, and that might have fistulas. There's pouchitis due to surgical complications, and you've kindly highlighted the timing difference. But there, I presume, also cryptoglandular fistulas that can occur in patients with pouches, and. and I, I want to know w when you look at someone's perineum and they have uh, ha have a pouch. Do they have the classical kind of Crohn's bottom, or or, or is it more um, or is it more the pouch that you focus on compared to the peri perianal skin? So to answer that question, someone has a perfect pouch with a terrible perineum. Those are the ones that it's not going to work. That's uh, subjective, anecdotal, but a patient can have a perfect crystal clean pouch and sometimes they can have the worst perianal area. Specifically, in the setting of a cuff or an ATZ that is left behind, if that area feels very velvety, shiny, ulcerated, that's slimmery, that uh, with a mucus, uh, it, it's tough to describe those things. Those are the things that worries me the most. Uh, but if they have a combined pouch and the uh, anal area, that may be a different story. So there is not like a one uh, size fits all type of a mindset. You're correct. People can have a cryptogranular fistula, but their symptoms and history and association is very, very different than the one that we have described about. Most of the ones, they have a systemic problems with a poor quality of life, either after the surgery, if it's a mechanical issue, or if the Crohn's disease is a true Crohn's fistula, years of years of doing great, suddenly things are changing. 
And we have looked at in the past, two to seven of percent of the patients in the long run after a pouch procedure can behave like Crohn's like. And that is something that I articulate every pouch patient that absence of proof is not proof of absence. This is something they may encounter at the time of initial JPOP surgery they need to be aware of. That there is nothing uh, like a hundred percent ulcerative colitis in this setting. You know, so I think the Thank you. it's very difficult to to be made because um, it's very rare to find granulomas in the biopsies. And sometimes time, you know, things will present itself, you know, um, after many years. And then you're gonna know that it's Crohn's after following this patient for many years. And sometimes it's difficult to make the diagnosis at the time of the presentation when you're just seeing the patient. Thank you. The authors in the study comment that after colectomy, 15 patients were reclassified as having indeterminate colitis. Does that make a difference in your assessment of patients with fistulas um, at all? Uh, to, to answer that question, really, after you do the J pouch, it becomes very secondary. If it's an initial colectomy, indeterminate colitis itself is not a reason for me not to do a J pouch procedure. You tell them a little bit higher pouch failure rates and, uh, you know, the, excuse me, a little bit fistulization rate, uh, but overall those patients' quality of life are pretty much uh, 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 similar. The issue is, I mean, there's a good amount of patients that initially when we used to do two-stage pouch procedure, they used to come back on Crohn's disease. So there's a Crohn's component that who behaves like an ulcerative colitis. That's a Genevieve Milton Mew from University of Minnesota right now. Her article showed the fact that if these, these there are certain Crohn's patients that do behave like an ulcerative colitis. Those patients were not the problem. The problem has been is the one that I defined, which is two to seven percent of the time, ulcerative colitis, everything well, and delayed diagnosis of Crohn's disease. Those are the ones we have no control of knowing it. And that's the reason I think we need to be more liberal about the disease presentation rather than the pathological diagnosis itself for patients who are interested not to be ending up with a permanent ileostomy. Right, thank you. Um, my next question is related to mucosectomy and Hanson and astomoses. The authors do comment, um, sorry, they did not identify that mucosectomy and Hanson and astomosis is a significant factor in fistula formation. Um, uh, but I, I guess currently with the accepted role of a double staple uh, pouch being a better functional result. What is the role of a mucosectomy? And do you think that a hand-sewn pouch uh, in not a revision, but, 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 a, but an initial pouch do, does have more complications such as strictures, which may result in fistula formation? If you allow me, I'm just going to have Dr. Kurat to speak about that because he has published the largest series in the world when he was Cleveland as a postdoc uh, re, uh, fellow of that uh, surgery article, mucosectomy. Dr. Kurat? Uh, we have published a study comparing Hanson versus staple of the IPAA, uh, including more than 3,000 patients. What we found is uh, uh, ancient septic complications, including fistula, pelvic abscesses, are were higher uh, with uh, patients with the uh, Hanson anastomosis compared to staple anastomosis. And also, the, uh, other complications were similar, but also we compared the functional outcomes and quality of life, and we found some difference in uh, incontinence rates, pad usage, uh, I mean, the functional rate is uh, stable patients, they do better, and then they have uh, less uh, septic complications compared to and so on. So on. Uh, unless it's indicated, which we will go uh, in uh, the slides later on, which is a low rectal cancer or dysplasia in the rectum, which is a mucosectomy or concern for a Crohn's disease, which we started more liberal about doing mucosectomy in those settings. So if someone has a perianal disease, maybe a simple fistula, uh, those are the settings that we're more liberal about doing a mucosectomy. Uh, to be honest with you, the evolution of the mucosectomy in a hands-on started with Vic Fazio, that who's mentor of Susan and uh, most of the people, uh, uh, you know, the and versus Professor Nichols, there was a concern. The concern was rightfully the Brits, they were worried about the fact that people were leaving a lot of cough. Uh, and then Vic and Ian, at that time, they felt like that was not the case. You can go really low down to be able to do the anastomosis by leaving only one and a half to two centimeter of anal transitional zone. 
They think that what should not be done in a later generation, your generation, become an issue. At that time, people just to do a pouch procedure, they were leaving a long cuff behind just to do a staple. And that was the big difference. So you can do properly all the way down and not to leave a long cuff to cause a proctitis to the patients. In this DNH, now that turned out with the laparoscopy and robot, which I'm not blaming the laparoscopy and the robot. It's uh, respectfully not the optimum way of doing a J-pouch procedure people are leaving a long cough. It's a repetition of the history in a different way. That is the difference between the mucosectomy and the stapled anastomosis. I mean, the rates of neoplasia in that area is very low. It's not zero. The chance of cophitis is less than 2% as long as you live very uh, uh, cough behind. And But the ones that the cuff that you leave behind, you need to surveillance. I still believe in that, especially the patients with the concern of Crohn's disease or a chronic pouchitis, chronic inflammation. Those are the ones you can get a horrible insidious cancer, whether it's mucosectomy or stapled anastomosis. To be honest with you, the only prehistorical people left doing a routine mucosectomy, Dr. F Phil Fleschner from Cedar sinai and he can handle what I said because I know him well. Otherwise, I think there, it's very rare you see a, a hands-on mucosectomy anastomosis done routinely. 17 to 20 percent of night and day seepage in the setting of the mucosectomy in a young age group, in my opinion, is not acceptable. Thank you. Um, my next question is: um, What is the role for a pouch advancement? Um, and what are some tips and warnings? And maybe, um, I don't know if it overlaps with one of the questions in the audience about a, a person who has a uh, leak after a redo pouch for FAP uh, and, and consideration of using an endo sponge. So I guess two things, endo sponge and um, yeah. pouch advancement. So the endo sponge, let me start with that. I think there is a place. Uh, unfortunately, when the Brown Company, company United States, in US, the surgeon said that they don't get leaks, so the company left the country and went back. So we do not have access to the proper endovac system. We developed the endovac system, Dr. Kurat published that here with our group that we used like four cases or not, it accelerates the thing. I think there's a place. The problem is the patient needs to stay in the hospital. You really cannot, at least in the US culture setting, you cannot do this on an outpatient setting in the office. They need anesthesia, they need to stay in the hospital, but it does accelerate the healing. The other question that you had, the pouch advancement uh, concept, uh, uh, Vic Fazio wrote that, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, the, in the past uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Hall, that if it's uh, just a fistula in the vagina, you may do that with the associated leak. Those are the patients I don't waste time. I have to go to abdominal uh, perineal pouch advancement. So it depends on what a pouch advancement is. If just a perineal pouch advancement, maybe on a, a rectal, excuse me, pouch vaginal fistula, it may be a value. Uh, I haven't done it for years. Most of these patients, I go from the top and the bottom. One thing in these, you know, reduce and the revision procedures that uh, I articulate to the referring doctors and my colleagues, it is okay to give a one shot, but you don't want to give more than one shot or so by decreasing the chance of another surgeon to be able to do a proper abdominal perineal redo by messing the sphincters, anything. By the way, I apologize for everybody that if I'm speaking a little bit fast, maybe too authoritarian, it is really no means to the respect to anybody, everybody's opinion. I just want to get going as much as information in a short time. Oh, thank you very much. Um, the fortunate thing that we have is that we can re, um, replay it on our YouTube channel at half speed. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a message that um, I can go slow. Okay, I will. <laughs> No, 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 no. It's perfectly fine. I, I do want to highlight that there's a there's a very interesting comment from Dr. Holobar in the chat. Um, uh, if people want to have a read of that, but um, I, I think in the interest of time, we still have a lot to get through. So perhaps we can move on to the next paper. Um, Our next paper uh, is from um, the Cleveland Clinic, um, and, and I, I think Dr. Holobar is one of the authors who's who's kindly in attending. Um, Dr. Leitner may be in the audience as well. She emailed me, but I, I haven't had an opportunity to screen through. Um, anyway, the paper is called Leaks from the Tip of the J Pouch, Diagnosis, Management, and Long-Term Pouch Survival. Um, this paper will be presented by Dr. Essen, and we have some extra comments given by Dr. Kirat. 
Um, now, I, I was fortunate to to start my fellowship year in Cleveland uh, with Dr. Kerrett, and he was very, um, very warm and welcoming. So I, I, um, I, um, uh, it's lovely to see you again. I haven't seen you for a few years, but particularly about this paper, I know that you've been mentioned in the discussion um, as you yourself have published um, on the same topic, I think in 2011. So it would be great to have your perspective on comparing the papers. So uh, let's start, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Aaron, one of the residents at NYU. So I'm going to present this paper. Uh, so for background, anastomotic leaks after IPR are most, most commonly occur at distal anastomosis, but also occasionally can occur at pouch body or tip of the J. So pou pou if, if it's not managed properly, pouch failure rates may, uh, may increase with, with, uh, with mismanagement of tip of the J pouch leaks. So this study aims to uh, describe the diagnosis, management, and uh, clinical outcomes after the tip of the J leaks. So this is, this is a single center retrospective cohort review that included 74 patients with uh, the tip of the J leaks. And majority of the patients in this paper were ulcerative colitis, over 95%, and all, all patients were primary pouches. So, and the outcome uh, of this paper was long term, besides the management, uh, was uh, the long term pouch survival. So, most, most common presentation with tip of the J pouch leak in this paper were uh, pelvic abscesses for 41%, followed by fistula, pouchitis, pain, acute abdomen in some cases, stricture at the IPA site, and sinuses. So, Majority of the patients were diagnosed after ileostomic closure if they had one, but some of the patients had the diagnosis before the ileostomic closures, and they were some of them were tried managed non-operatively. So me, the median time to diagnose in this paper for tip of the J pouch leaks were 11 months, but it ranged between three to 26 months after IPAA, and the majority of the leaks required solvent solvent surgery. So this is, this is a survival curve that shows that with, with the management of the tip of the J pouch leaks, you can get a 86% uh, of a pouch survival rates in, in the five year period. So this is, this is the management uh, in the paper that mentioned that uh, the majority of the patients, like 80, 89% of the patients required a, a salvage, like attempted salvage surgery. So those salvage surgery, like the most common, the, the most common one was pouch repair, either stapled or or, re, or just putting a suture on it or, or combination of both. Some of the patients required disconnection uh, of the IPA and repair and reanastomosis, and the, some of the patients required a new new IPA. And the pouch was salvaged in 86 percent of the patients, which is impressive. To conclude, tip of the J pouch leaks were re relatively uncommon in this uh, patient cohort, and leaks had like variable clinical presentations. In, in the majority, diagnosis was made often after like ileostomy reversal. A majority of the leaks required salvage surgery, and salvage surgery had a high pouch salvage rate in this in this paper. Thank you very much for this succinct summary. Um, now, can we please have some expert comments from Dr. Kirat? Thank you. Uh, yes, it's uh, nice to see you uh, too, after six years. Uh, we <laughs> uh, you know, we published with Dr. Ramsey 2011, the first initial paper, uh, which included a little less than uh, 30 patients. Actually, the uh, outcomes were very similar, uh, just the rate we found 0.5%, uh, this paper shows 1% uh, leak rate. Uh, and, you know, the tip of the J-Pouch leak is very, uh, rare, not uncommon, but the second place for leak uh, after pouch surgery following uh, IPA leak. And also it is uh, most of the time inherent course, uh, it's hard to diagnose. I mean, the, we can see the, this, uh, the, the, you know, the diagnosis uh, after surgery, the median time to diagnose is really long. And some patients, uh, majority of the patients diagnosed uh, after nucleus and closure. Uh, the, and also they have like a 
variable presentations like symptoms, uh, it's really hard to tell this is the genetic of the J-power shape because they present with the abscesses, fistulas, or pain, uh, fevers, uh, one specific uh, presentations. Uh, and also when they present with the, uh, sometimes they present with the fistula and then when we see the fistula after part surgery, we always think about this is Crohn's or IKA leak, uh, more than uh, tip of the genital pouch leak. Uh, and in terms of, uh, and also the one thing in the paper, uh, the majority of the patients had two-stage surgery. Maybe those patients were on steroids or biologics at the time of part surgery compared to three-stage procedures. In terms of uh, diagnosis of uh, tip of genital pouch leak, Actually, if someone comes with the suspicion of uh, tip of J pouch leak, usually we do uh, EUA with pouchoscopy and also MRI and uh, gastrography enema. Uh, but uh, the sometimes all the, the, the imaging and the, the, the tests are, were, uh, are uh, negative. Uh, but uh, I find that the MRI really useful. Uh, sometimes, you know, it shows the uh, abscess cavity and the fistula between the tip of J uh, uh, pouch and then the abscess and you can predict that it's uh, coming from tip of the J pouch and I found the pouch... I to interrupt, the MRI is it with contrast or without? Uh, with the contrast. As in rec um, pouch contrast? Uh, no, we don't use the pouch contrast, uh, uh, just the, uh, you know, IV. Uh, but also parchoscopy is, uh, because it's hard to reach compared to the IPA leak, uh, usually it's uh, hard to uh, uh, diagnose uh, to me. Uh, and also the, here we have seen some uh, tip of J-Pouch leaks. Also after IR drainage, when they do the drain study, sometimes we see the fistula uh, to the tip of the J and then we make the diagnosis. And then, you know, some patients, uh, this really requires a in, uh, high index of uh, suspicion uh, when it comes to diagnosis. And some patients require just exploration and then you find the tip of the J-pouch at the time of uh, redo pouch. And then in terms of uh, prevention, I think the, the uh, reinforcing the suture line, uh, it really helps. I think the, in the study they showed some uh, better outcomes uh, uh, long term if you do the reinforcement. Uh, we always do reinforcement sutures and also when we staple the distal end of the, uh, uh, the terminal limb, when we create the tip of the J, uh, we, we do a, use an a, a acute angle uh, when we staple and then make sure it's clean. And recently we've been using also ICG just to confirm uh, good blood supply at the tip of the J and then some patients we really didn't see good blood supply after ICG and then we just restable. Uh, and then the uh, and the management uh, is in this study and also in our initial study uh, most patients are, are underwent uh, uh, just local repair if feasible uh, hands-on or uh, Staple and some patients, if they present with the large abscesses, uh, you know, severe inflammation, frozen pelvis, and when we do the pouch dissection, we cause uh, holes in the pouch, and then they require uh, pouch excision or uh, redo anastomosis. But most of the time, the, the, the local repair is uh, feasible. And also, initial paper, we uh, compared the functional outcomes and quality of life between the patient with the tip of J-pouch leak uh, repairs versus IPA patient without any complications, they have similar uh, functional outcomes long-term uh, and quality of Thank you. Thank you for that. Just one question to um, the team about the over of the staple line and the tip of the J. Now, is this a hemostatic stitch or is this like Lambert sutures? Is there a particular yeah. way you think this works better yeah so uh, we don't lambert it and that was uh, your countryman belated countryman uh, from tasmania uh, uh, john oakley uh, he used to make the point very clear lambert thing actually puts more pressure on the staple line so if somebody gonna uh, suture the staple line we prefer over sewing it rather than lamberting it i i again i we don't, at least I can speak, I don't like Lambert for the reason that John Oakley taught me 
that it puts a, a pressure. I, I mean, this tip of the J it drives you nuts that you get like a run of it and everything. Now we're doing an ICG. We have no conflict of interest with this company at all. We don't believe we can use this for everything, but we do like to use a selective use it. And this is one of them because if it's really such an insidious and draining uh, complication, it can be an issue. Just to get back on a couple of the things, this drain injection study before somebody pulls the drain out after somebody has a pelvic abscess is very critical. And you need to have a good radiologist who's doing that study that they need to be looking at it, a lot of tickling stuff, because those things can become an issue after you close the ileostomy, you're going to back to zero with the three-stage procedure. As what articulated by Dr. Kurat, MRI is key. As a group, we come more and more believing the MRI just rather than just the GGE, specifically before we close a redo uh, J pouch procedure, redo pouch procedure, we add routine pelvic MRI now on top of a gastrograph and enema. In addition to this, any patient after even a primary J pouch procedure, if these patients have any mischief postoperatively, we believe gastrograph and enema is not suffice. And we also add an MRI to these patients just to make sure we're not missing it and not starting the clock back again. Thank you for that. Now, um, we're fortunate to have one of the authors, as I mentioned, Dr. Holliber. Um, if I can possibly get him to say a few words about either the paper um, or his experience in, and, and tips to, um, to juniors about writing papers for this year or anything else um, uh, you like. Oh, thanks so much, Vlad. And it's such an honor to be um, asked to uh, to talk about this paper uh, because Dr. Kirat, who I've uh, not met, um, and Dr. Ramsey and uh, Dr. Kiran were the inspirations for this paper. It, it was pretty hard to go through the data because, as Dr. Kirat mentioned, it's a very heterogeneous group of patients that the tip of the J when it fistulizes can when it leaks can fistulize anywhere. Uh, to any organ you can imagine. It's just like Crohn's disease, except it's a technical complication. As was elucidated, we think that, you know, highly angulating the, um, you know, acute angle of stapling at the tip of the J with a heavy stapler is uh, is probably the only way we can try to prevent this other than having a lack of tension and excellent blood supply. Uh, but um, as was mentioned, you have to have a high index of suspicion when patients are having unexplained pelvic sepsis and not having the expected great outcome of, you know, lack of pelvic pain, lack of symptoms, just happy with their seven to eight bowel movements for 24 hours. You have to start to dig deeper. And if you can't find it, then look deeper. And that's uh, thank you. I'm glad for my comments. And again, it's an honor to speak with everybody. Um, thank you for joining. Um, I've got a few other questions. Um, I'll direct them to Dr. Ramsey and then he can distribute if he sees fit. Um, so I guess the hypothesis of the tip of the J, at least the way I understand it, is that the defect is, is in the anti-mesenteric uh, line. Is that usually the case or, or is it anywhere within the staple line? Um, I ask this specifically because obviously if it's on the anti-mesenteric line, then the angulation of the stapler may help, but um, otherwise it probably makes a little difference. Well, I, I, to be honest with you, it can be a very little one. Insidious will have a very little video, video uh, in, you know, the, uh, later, but it can be a big blown off thing and you don't know what, what happened. The critical thing sometimes when the pouch is not done properly, then you can have a combination of these leaks. And you can have a small pouch, posterior leak, and a blown up uh, anterior. And the point that Stefan made is very true. We have a patient on Thursday where this lady leaked from the tip of the J pouch. It went through the, at the, at the previous of a uterine uh, incision. And she's been telling me that she's having a stool coming out of the vagina. We spent like three EUAs, MRIs. We cannot find any hole in the vagina. Guess what? We finally got this thing. This thing tip drained into the previous uh, uh, uterine incision and it's coming from the cervix all to the, uh, to the vagina itself as a drainage. So it can find its way to drain out um, and it can create a very hostile thing. So when these things leak, 
people really feel bad about it. They understand about it and they like to repair it all at once. I really caution that. If the things are really hostile, you may need to divert these patients for a while, as in the paper, until the things cools off and tackle it down six months later. The critical thing on these pouch patients, IBD patients, you really need to be direct, caring, and blunt about the plan of care rather than rushing it and not giving them a clear of plan. Those are the things that they do not uh, forgive. If you give them the clear outline plan, they will be all right. I'm going to ask Dr. Arman Arkan, uh, what, would, what do you use to inject to do the ICG in these settings and what more do you use to check? So we do it. Uh, we do it uh, like the other colorectal uh, anastomotic uh, procedures. Uh, we inject two or three cc of ICG, uh, and then we uh, recently you started using both modes: the uh, uh, green mode and the uh, black and white mode. Uh, which one is your favorite? Uh, mine is green. Uh, how about you, Doctor Simon? Black and white. Yeah, we're still polling in the operating room. We'll let you guys know in a month that what's the decision, whether green or black and white mode. But go ahead, please, Vlad. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, my next question is actually about um, uh, sort of non-operative approaches to these leaks. Um, specifically, the authors mention IR drainage and. Yeah. Also, endoscopic clipping. Um, I wonder if anyone has attempted to put a, a endoscopic um, drain or stent, like a um, like a biliary stent, into the defect. So from the pouch to the um, to the cavity, similar to what we would for a, say a mushroom catheter for a for a dehistonastomosis uh, in the in uh, dehist coloanal anastomosis. Yeah, I, I think this IR drainage is very reasonable. The problem, the area still doesn't heal. I mean, if the hole is big enough, you can see the thing popping out rather than the IR, you may make an incision, put it there, but you got to be careful because those things can be matted with a lot of bile around there. So the IR drainage, I think is pretty good. Regarding this uh, bear claw and everything, I'm not being funny. I actually have a necklace of that seven of them that was put to clip the tip of the J pouch. I mean, you can give a one shot, it is okay, but you've got to be careful this innovative idea of pushing the limit of trying to do more, less is more in these settings. One is okay, two is okay. Uh, but again, uh, it, we don't need to have a necklace of these things picking up from the operating room. Enough is enough with these clipping things. We need to caution that. The other things I gotta be careful, uh, my colleagues, they're talking about the metal and blue, these areas. You gotta be careful. The metal and blue creates an incredibly inflammatory reaction in the pelvis. So I or caution you, caution on that uh, to be able to identify the, the thing. Just go down, talk to the patient, mobilize the things, check the things if you're concerned, fix it, divert or primary repair, or when the things are really bad, as what's uh, articulated uh, on Stefan's uh, paper, because these patients need to understand when they go to the tip of the JPI repair surgery, they may end up with a permanent back. There is a chance that the procedure may have to go to a major rudu, including the mucosectomy and hands-on anastomosis with a new pouch. The patient needs to be informed and consent for that possibility. It's not just the tip of the J-pipe repair. Thank you. Um, the other question I have is, I guess certainly people of my generation, I assume, have much less experience with S pouches. Um, uh, now, do S pouches have a tip of the S problem? Um, or, or and do colonic J pouches have a tip of the J problem? Is this inherent to the small bowel um, and the J formation? Or does it happen with every sort of pouch where the distal end uh, is problematic? Colonic J do have the problem, uh, seen it. Uh, you gotta make sure that you need to limb a little bit longer. So that may help out like the coloplasty we used to do. You need to be four to six centimeter away from the tip. So the coloplasty, we don't use that anymore. Uh, or, you know, actually not coloplasty, Baker, uh, side to end on stomachs, you need to be four to six centimeter from the tip because they can have the same problem as much as the, uh, you know, the, uh, in that. The, the, uh, you know, I don't think it's only the, uh, the tip of the J uh, small bowel uh, problem. It's a chronic problem. The other thing is that, as what Dr. Kurat said, if these things happening a lot, you really start to question it, the Crohn's disease. We had a couple of cases 
repaired it. You, know, you got to blame yourself once. When it happened for the second time, then you got to think about, am I missing something here that may be leaning towards the Crohn's disease that's articulated? It can happen in that. Thank you. Um, I guess we kind of touched, my last question before we move on to the next step, we kind of touched about the technique of um, forming the, the tip of the J. Um, and I don't know if you uh, are going to mention it just in the special guest segment or if you can cover it now. Tips when forming a J pouch. Uh, what are the salient points that, that you would want other people to know? Yeah, so one thing I forgot to answer, the S doesn't get the tip of the J pouch. It gets the body of the J, uh, body of the S leak because it's a two suture line bring the three limb together. But if you can make an argument that at the top that the area covers towards there, that you call that a tip, that's like the crutch angle, that may be the area. But the S should not be getting a tip of the t tip leak unless it's a exit conduit at the anastomosis. Uh, uh, I forgot the answer. Okay. Regarding creating a J pouch, I think the critical thing, the tension-free anastomosis and a good blood supply, that's the number one thing. And one needs to do everything in their power possible to accomplish that. So I do not have rules the fact that I need to have a 20, 25 centimeter each limb J pouch. I can settle as far as down to 12 centimeter as long as the things do reach properly with the least tension. The problem that I see on the things that the patients have a tension issue, you can see the surgeon making a much smaller pouch to be able to make that difference. Those are the ones that leaks, checking the one's footsteps, as what Caldwell Elsestein used to say, tells you when somebody has a small pouch and tip of the J pouch and on stomatic leak, that means they had a major reach issue. I'm a believer of taking the iliocolic artery, contrary to the EN livery. I'm a believer of a mesoposteriorly rather than anteriorly. You cannot take the iliocolic artery and the last branch of the SMA. Then the pouch will be looking at you, you'll be looking at the pouch. However, if you want to keep the iliocolic artery, then you can take the last branch of the SMA, which the iliocolic artery can feed. The reason that I take the iliocolic artery for two reasons. One, at the time of the colectomy, when you take the iliocolic artery, that six months is going to give a chance for the small bowel to elongate itself so the reach issues can be overcome six months later when you're doing the J pouch. That's number one. The other thing is that when the S pouch will not reach, uh, excuse me, when the J pouch will not reach, you have to take the iliocolic artery to create the S pouch. So these are some of the tips that I might suggest. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, th this has been a fantastic discussion. Thanks for people who have added things to the chat. Um, we may move to the next slide, and this is the result of the poll. Um, so, Stephen, if you can um, summarize those, please. Yeah, so I pulled it up. So, as with you know, any good poll, there's there's a huge diversion uh, between uh, difference between opinions here, and the highest that anyone got was 36 percent with the the concept that it can be avoided in medically stable patients. And then, uh, other than that, we had a quarter of uh, respondents. Taking using it for as a default for all of their pouches, and then um, another quarter wanted to avoid this in patients that are having an oncologic surgery. Thank you. So I, I guess my question to to the team is: there are publications that favor a three stage pouch formation, obviously, but there are others, and we featured one this week. Uh, sorry, this month from Hershey, Pennsylvania, for example, that suggests that diversion can sometimes be avoided without any significant morbidity. So, Dr. Ramsey and team, where do you sit on this and why? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I can, the, the, the thing is like we're repeating the history. We have written this like so many years, 2001, that selective omission is something that I understand, but the gold standard therapy just to avoid the ileostomy, I mean, they may have a different God. But the fact is just routinely not to divert somebody and to tr promote that, that is something I am not going to be part of it and give this a national or international message. One thing that with, which I really made my point to my dear friend Antonio uh, Spinelli and Yves Penis, first and last author, the most recent ECHO recommendations that I do not agree that the modified two-stage procedure with no ileostomy is a gold standard. That is very dangerous. If you're going to do a no ileostomy in a small country as big as Rhode Island with one big center where you have a control of these patients, be my guest. I have no problem. 
But if you're going to give a message to the whole world, the fact that the modified, modified two-stage procedure should be the gold stand therapy of a J-pouch procedure, my God, our group will be doing these video pouches after I'm dead you know, for a long time. So that is something that I strongly caution people. If you're going to divert, do a selective omission. You know, the perfect procedure, complete donuts, minimal on medications, motivated patient, and motivated infrastructure to handle and manage these things. Otherwise, we're going to be creating problem for a long time. Below. So that's my opinion to our Hershey, Pennsylvania group. So the next segment in, in um, uh, that we usually have is the um, is the special guest segment. Um, as I've already said several times, we're very fortunate to be with a with an excellent group this month. Um, uh, Dr. Ramsey is our special guest. Um, uh, there's a very brief summary of his current uh, position and 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 the amount of papers he's published. Uh, in essence, he's an internationally recognized expert in colorectal surgery, particularly in uh, pelvic pouch surgery and revisional pouch surgery. Um, and uh, on a personal level, I've never met him face to face. We've had a couple of interactive interactions on Twitter and, and more recently on Zoom. But what struck me for someone who's obviously so busy, he's actually incredibly approachable, uh, which is which is something that I um, always find unexpected when you when you hear these big names. Um, but uh, it's nice to see that uh, that the people behind them are just people. Thank you so much, uh, Vlad, for that kind introduction. I just want to articulate the fact that personally, uh, you know, the, uh, I'm nobody uh, uh, without my partners. Uh, that was the case uh, in my old institution. That is the case right now. And I simply would like to recognize all of their hard work, dedication, makes us who we are uh, today. And this was the group that I articulated that is really the engine uh, for the uh, NYU uh, you know, the uh, colorectal surgery collectively as groups. And I also like to recognize the, uh, the alumni, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, in that these are the groups that we are a new program. And these lads are wonderful and gals, wonderful, uh, you know, the colleagues that they're working very hard in different parts of the world. So uh, as what I told you, I promise Susan, I will try to wrap this up very quickly. Despite you gave me 20 minutes, Vlad, I'll try to make it in five minutes. All right. So this is a gold standard procedure of a, I do believe that. So you go to Brits, uh, England and everything, it drives me nuts. People are doing pouch surgery. They're saying that I rather have an ileostomy, a J pouch. Then don't do it. If you believe the fact that an end ileostomy for your patients is better, then the J pouch you're doing, please don't do it. I feel very strongly about this thing. I don't know it's got to do with the NHS or a socialized system and everything, but I do believe at least we should encourage the patients at least to give it a try, as long as they're a good candidate for this thing. But if they're happy with the ileostomy, that's fine. I'm a believer of the initial colectomy with an end ileostomy, leaving the rectal sigmoid behind. So leave the rectal sigmoid behind so you can come back and find the rectum easier. I still do tag under the uh, skin about the fascia, if the things do leak, it leaks as a wound infection rather than a pelvic abscess. It's important that you have a two size flange between the ileostomy and the midline because 20, 30 percent of the time that mucosa falls apart. So you don't want to have the flange overlapping the ileostomy. Patients will hear, hate you during that six months they're waiting for the ileostomy, excuse me, proctectomy. I do believe I'm a believer of a posterior mesoplane, anteriorly stayed behind the Denon Villiers. Denon Villiers was a French surgeon, a plastic surgeon, who actually initially did the first cleft plat surgery. Uh, I don't uh, leave the meso behind for the reasons we'll talk about. This is something I learned from my mentor, Vic Fazio. Proximal interfilling a joint is the area I like to staple it. That leaves around one to two centimeter maximum of an anal transitional zone behind. I do not call this rectal cuff. I call it the anal transitional zone. Believer of a double stapling technique, laparoscopy robot, however you want to do it. If you're using more than a one linear stapler line, you're looking for a trouble. Even that means that I do a hybrid procedure with a fanistein or a lower midline at the second stage. I make that point very clear to my patients. Go someplace else if you're going to have this thing to be done robotically, laparoscopically, as long as you come across with one shot. Uh, there's a eight finger hunt article on this thing. The more you fire, the more likely you have a leak. 
as what I articulated, 12 to 20 centimeter each leap, uh, each limb, fire of a ILA 100 or GI 100 times two tip of the J pouch, you know, the transected with the angulation that was articulated by the, Dr. Crud and oversaw with a 3-0 Vicro. Check for a leak. If there's no leak, go down to the bottom. Try to come posterior to the uh, staple line, especially with female, the vagina can fall down and can create a catastrophic pouch vaginal fistulization. It's very important to have a centimeter of a distance between the anterior suture and it, between the transected line and the posterior vagina, vagina to be elevated to do the double stapling technique. Double stapling technique is something we believe and we like to divert the patients unless it's a FAP patient, very eager patient for dysplasia with the tissues are okay. We may consider doing a one stage procedure, which we have done probably around four out of the 400 close to one that we have done in the last uh, five to six years here, only four patients. So we don't do it regularly. We do it very, very selectively as a one through one stage. This is the area how you can elongate the mesentery to be able to have the things to reach. I do believe taking the iliocolic artery at the first stage of the procedure is good to have the mesentery to elongate so the things can reach. You do make the scoring or on the SMA, not true, scoring, and then that will help out another centimeter or two. This is something that we submitted to ASCRS, Dr. Dan Wong, if gets accepted, will go to present uh, overall 331 uh, ilia pouch or five years. Yes, the things cannot reach around 1.2%. Uh, like number one thing was the obesity, there's my tumors and a short mesentery. That's pretty much made up that three or four patient in other way. So there's one patient we retreated, then we were able to do it a year later with the S5. So don't burn the bridges on a motivated patients to go back. These are our indications for- Sorry, a Dr. Ramsey, just to interrupt, you mentioned retreated. So you did a proctectomy? Yeah, no, no. And then you came so this back? Patient, or... Yeah, this patient had a, he came for a redo pouch. So I couldn't uh, get the pouch done. I put some separate film down there, put a drain there. I uh, put a little circumferential uh, suture at the anus and then come back a year later told her to lose some weight and everything. It was a nightmare, but right now she's doing great without any ileostomy. So again, you need to push the limit depending on the motivation of the patient, okay? So this is our uh, abstract that we submitted, very brief information. These are numbers, overall reach issue, one to two percent did not reach. Number one reasons as emphasized behind and one of them was able to go as an S pouch. We do, a mucosectomy in this setting, dysplasia on the cancer in the colon rectum, where it is, if it's a lower dysplasia, two thirds of the rectum or a cancer, we like to do a mucosectomy itself. Otherwise, we're very liberal about a stapled anastomosis as long as it is not too, uh, it's not left long. So this is our principle uh, collectively when it comes to review pouch. When one can live happily and good quality of life with a stoma, trying to convince them for a redo pouch surgery is a great disservice. So this should not be our agenda. However, if one cannot live happily and a good life with a stoma, trying to convince them for a pouch excision is also a great disservice. And I'm saying it from the bottom of my heart because these patients go through so much. We had 47 uh, out of, actually 48 out of the 50 states, uh, you know, the uh, came over here. We're looking for somebody show up from North Dakota and Delaware, then we'll just make it up 50 states. But people really travel. So trying to tell these patients, go on per permanent ileostomy is not that simple. They just need to understand what they're getting into. I think it's very critical. So these are the things that can happen. Uh, I think one needs to be humble. Uh, my father was a surgeon. He always said the fact that don't be ever critical of your colleague's complication. The same complication can happen to you the next time. You don't know how the hell it happened. So speaking with full humility, but also with confidence that whoever is going to do the J-POP surgery at least should be able to handle these complications. If they cannot, then the patients need to be liberally sent to a referral centers, their choice. Again, this is a teamwork. Uh, this is a thing that you need to go respectful with humility from the, your operating room, your partners. We double team these cases and it's a gastroenterologist, the pathologist, radiologist and strategize. Repetition is the mother of the uh, skills as, you know, the Vic Fazio used to always say. And this is a teamwork. 
Now, general principles, as what we said, check your own footsteps. Did the patient have a septic complications? We talked about these things. We are very liberal about getting the gastrograph and enema, pelvic MRI, flexible pouchoscopy, strategize these patients before the surgery. You got to work with the same radiologist. Our MRIs are read by only three radiologists here, and anybody who's going to read it, they need to be retrained by this other three radiologists to have the permission to read our pelvic MRI in these settings. We did this template, and I refer you to this article. It's a great article that radiologists wrote. And these are the things we see. A posterior leak can be seen in this thing, or other one, a huge cuff with a leak pouch distended backed up the MRI. I think the, the test of choice in these settings, they can see much more than my EUAs, gastrographin and a flexible pouchoscopy. So we rely on them a lot. And that's the strategy. We like to divert these patients initially six months if they're not diverted, be prepared unexpected, get the ureteric stents. We're very liberal, over 600 ureteric stents, less than 1% any complication related to that with ureteric injury. It tells you sometime the importance of, about being prepared to unexpected. You need to excise the phlegmon. If you don't excise the phlegmon, this infection will come back. Known to unknown, pelvic dissection, caudal to cranial, which means most of the time the sacral area is really stuck. You need to go down to the presacral area to the pouch and then come back up cranially, circling the enemy as what we talk around here. Thoughtful iliacin was very critical, which means strategizing. If we're going to do a redo, you need to be prepared to have the potential this area to becoming a new pouch if you cannot use this pouch. Otherwise, that if you injure the pouch and you had the ileostomy here or there, you need to be going very, very high up. So art of complex colorectal surgery to see a couple steps ahead. So that's the reason we like to use a thoughtful ileostomy. And once again, I don't have any agenda for a stapled anastomosis, but specifically in these settings, we like to do a hands-on anastomosis. Vlad, do you have any question? Did you say something or did I miss something? No, no, uh, okay. please keep going. I, I, right. I don't have any questions. So Thank this you. is the thing. If the symptoms happen the first six months or immediately after surgery, six to 12 months, the things are really mechanical. If it goes beyond, it's Crohn's disease. But the patient knows sometimes they may have both. And that's the reason we tell the patients, let's fix the mechanical issues. If you have a chronic concern of Crohn's disease, we've been pretty liberal about the biologics right now. And our post redo pouch patients, they are on biologics up to 20 to 30%. So we're not shy about that. I think we need to collaborate our forces with our gastroenterology colleagues. So let's go over these things. The people talk about the meso, meso, meso. And this is a patient that was years of suffering with a fistulization. This is the problem. When you leave the meso behind like this and you put the pouch through that area, through that meso, and this is my concern with the transanal TME approach when I spoke to Willem, that these patients get this type of a problem. It gets strictured and their issue do not start immediately, but it starts years later by fistulization, like the septic complications our colleagues from Mount Sinai articulated. So that's the reason I'm a believer of not a, we're a believer of a, not a full meso, but a partial majority mosa excision, especially posteriorly, and you can leave a little bit laterally, anteriorly behind to avoid the nerve injury, as long as the patient do not have dysplasia or cancer. And this is something when you leave the meso, excuse, when you don't leave the meso behind, you do this nice pouch relaxing and expanding without a problem. When you have the pouch being shoved through this meso, and this is the problem with the pediatric surgeons has done so many years because of the worry about the injury of the nerves that they put the things and these patients really came back many, many years down the line. These patients do not come the first year or two. They come usually five to 10 years later, and some of them can pop out fistulization, everything as can be seen here through the anus as a fistulation on these patients. Again, lone rectum stump. I tell my colleagues and our fellows and residents, if you're double stapling somebody, that means that the proper proctectomy was not done, which means as you and I, talk about this Vlad at the pre-zoom area with uh, bladed Jack Mackey. If somebody is using a PI-60, excuse me, TA-60 or a, a PI-45, uh, you know, that means they have not mobilized it. I describe these things, the levator fibers, like the ballroom dancing in the French Revolution, those fibers needs to be tubularized 
to be able to come across. If you're using anything greater than PI30 in these settings, you have left a long cough behind as can be seen here. That was really the, uh, the case. This is another case in this setting, long rectal cuff, mesorectum, patch twisted, obstructed defecation. Guess what? Patient has a beautiful incision. Guess what? Patient had a very large incision at the end because we compromise it a lot just for the sake of the incision. And look at this pure suffering, this patient labeled as a Crohn's disease and everything like that with years and years. Again, we need to check our footsteps. This is the tip of the J pouch leak, as that, that angulation, what Dr. Kurat was talking about, having the mesomore uh, cranial, and then the tip is more caudal, so it will help out the leak. And this is how the leak can be so insidious. We barely found that thing being very suspicious about it when the patient got septic complications. And this is the other leak. This patient had a leak, but was this the only problem? Look at the size of the pouch. When somebody has a significant problems with the technical issues, this is what the patients end with. Small pouch like six or seven centimeters, these patients are gonna leak, tip of the J pouch is gonna leak, and then this is not the tip of the J pouch leak with Stefan's article articulated, I think 30 or more percent had to go to a redo in this setting. Don't call everything Crohn's because they have a thickened mesentery. The same concept of the Crohn's thickening mesentery can happen with the obstructive defecation. So this patient, we also did a redo. So we do not have a low threshold to excise somebody's pouch when we feel this thickened mesentery. And this is the thing. Uh, this is something that I learned my belated mentor. You got to excise this phlegmon to be able to have a thing. And, you know, uh, you really got to pray on everything that you know in these settings because of a tremendous bleeding that you may get into. You got to get in there with the humility, with the trust of your partner when you get into trouble and the anesthesiology colleagues. If you don't excise this rind of tissue that the things are going to bleed, uh, the, excuse me, the things are not going to heal. And this is the good old that uh, Ian Lavery scissors, John scissors, its actual name is called the uterine decapitating scissors it was used, can be used to be able to excise this phlegma and the chronic infection. And the last thing is, again... Uh, the Sorry, Dr. Ramsey, can I pause there? Um, there's, a, there's a comment in the chat, and you've sort of mentioned about the bleeding. Yeah. Um, would, you mind, would you mind elaborating on your approach to pelvic bleeding. How do you try to avoid it? And if you do get into it, what are your uh, damage control steps? Yeah, so again, you need to do this, uh, uh, you know, the humility. Our chair here, when he recruited me, he used to say the fact that you guys are operating on metaphysical planes, and it is a metaphysical plane. There is no plane there. So again, you thank the mentors who taught you that you work in that planes, but you need to be very careful. Think about the pelvis like a wishbone. A wishbone in your mind, you need to think that. So don't go too laterally. Then you're going to get the internal iliac vein or artery. And the chronic rhine of tissue, like the diverticulitis, do help not to get the presacral bleeding compared to a non-infected pelvis in a rectal cancer setting. That helps out. If you get in the bleeding. You got to have your own nurse all the time in there to be able to help you. You got to have your budgets. You got to have your 5-0. You got to do a muscle tamponade. The first thing that those things happen, I talk to anesthesia. If it's a resident, please get, get your staff here. No, no, we're okay. Get your staff here. No, we're okay. Get your staff here. So they need to be prepared for the setting that that they're going to have a major blood loss. When you look at the literature, presacral bleeding can happen 1% to 10%. And there's a potential 1% bleeding rate. And I was this close losing a patient when I first arrived here in one year. So it can be very humbling. We still use a thumb stack in these settings. Worst comes to worst. You pack this patient with a six, eight by 36, uh, you know, the sponge, and you come back 24 to 72 hours. If it rebleeds again, you repack it again. How do I know that? I had two patients like that. And I prayed to everything that I know in my life. And after that, everything stopped that we, you know, the bleeding stopped. And at that time you abort, come back for a pouch another day in six months down the line. That was the thing. So this is our conclusion in these settings that I think we went through this a lot. These are some of the things that we call the NYU-isms, NYU circle the enemy when you deal with this pathology, that when you get these things, this is my dear friend, Ken Kula, uh, who's a great artist in Cleveland who drove these. Always go from known to unknown. Don't get into trouble. Expect the unexpected. You know, be prepared for it. 
Retreat is a sign of maturity. Don't make it an ego issue by harming the patient. Be humble. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Even it means it's going to be a big hit on your ego. And always, you don't want to leave the operating room with this type of anastomosis. You got to leave that operating room with a good blood supply and a happy anastomosis. That's the thing that we must do when we leave the operating room. If we leave the operating room without this picture, something is back going to happen. Thank you so much all your time. I appreciate every effort and I'll be happy to take, we'll be happy to take any more questions. If Thank you very much. That, that's a fantastic presentation. I, I, for one, have learned a lot. I'm sure others have as well. Um, if anyone has anything in the chat uh, or want to send anything in the chat, um, you're welcome to. I've tried to kind of keep an eye on it and, and, and cover it as much as I could. Everyone's just saying it's a great talk, um, and it is. So thanks again to NYU, um, to everyone. This is recorded and will be available on YouTube. Uh, and next month we're going to be at um, – uh, Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School with um, Daniel Feingold being the special guest talking about anal fissures. Um, okay. Thank you so much. We're saying bye from NYU, all of us. Okay. Bye, guys. Thank you.